Explicit content is found in this episode. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to the True Crime Fan Club Podcast. I'm your host, Lainey. In the previous episode, I discussed Diana Lumbrera, who likely suffered from Munchausen syndrome by proxy. She intentionally suffocated her children to reap the insurance benefits and attention given to her. Lacey Spears enjoyed the same attention almost as much as Diana did, except Lacey had a bigger platform to expose her situation. Okay, on to the show. Lacey Spears was born on October 16, 1987, in Atwater, California, to Terry and Tina Spears. The family would move to Decatur, Alabama in 1988. Terry, a former airplane mechanic, worked as a welder to support his family while Tina remained at home to raise their three children. Lacey didn't have an extremely close bond with either of her parents. She later attributed this to her parents' chronic illnesses. She felt that they were too distracted taking care of themselves to pay her any attention. Lacey's older sister, Rebecca, fondly remembers them playing house together, with Lacey always choosing to be the mama. Rebecca thought her sister was a natural caregiver. She coddled her dolls as if they were real children. When Lacey entered preschool, she really shined and showed off her exuberant personality and vivid imagination. Many of her classmates would consider her to be outgoing, funny, and extremely playful. You see... Lacey loved being the center of attention. A childhood friend of Lacey's named Mallory shared with author John Glatt, who wrote the book My Sweet Angel, The True Story of Lacey Spears, a troubling story from their childhood. One day after school, Mallory had gone over for a play date with Lacey. This was the first time Mallory visited Lacey's house. It took a while for Mallory's mother to come around to the idea because she always felt something was very off about the Spears family. Everything was going fine until Mallory picked up one of Lacey's American Girl dolls. Before she knew it, Lacey had tightly wrapped her hands around Mallory's neck. Mallory broke free from Lacey's grip and really had no idea what to think of it. She was barely seven years old. When Mallory's mother picked her up and noticed the bruising around her neck, she immediately approached Tina Spears to ask about what happened. Despite Mallory trying to play it off, her mother was not having it. She angrily told Tina that this would be the last time Mallory would spend any time with Lacey. Lacey would have no problems making new friends after the loss of Mallory and found a quick friend in Jessica Kyle. Jessica would later share with various news agencies the story of how she and Lacey met. She recalled being in third grade on the playground. She was waiting to use the monkey bars, but Lacey paid her no attention. Jessica grew so frustrated with Lacey's lack of courtesy that she ended up pushing her, causing her to lose her grip on the bar. Lacey shoved her back and Jessica spit on her glasses. A teacher nearby spotted the disagreement and pulled the girls aside. She implored them to shake hands and apologize to each other. The girls reluctantly agreed to shake hands and apologize, but after that day, they gave friendship a chance and were inseparable. Lacey would spend most of her free time at Jessica's house. Unlike with Mallory, Lacey never tried to harm Jessica for playing with her dolls. Lacey always insisted that she bring her doll everywhere she go. She rarely had close relationships to fall back on when she needed the love and attention that all children need to have a healthy relationship. The one person she could always count on for love was her grandpa, Paul. They spent many weekends together, just having the time of their lives. She was in fifth grade when her mother and father sat her down to share some devastating news about her grandfather. Lacey was confused. How could Grandpa Paul be dead? She cried, but was barely consoled by her family over the loss. When her grandmother Florence moved to Clearwater, Florida to live with her Uncle Bo, Lacey was ecstatic. She loved her Uncle Bo and was eager to visit her family in Clearwater. Lacey shared with her sister Rebecca that she was going to live on the beach someday. 
She would scuba dive, swim in the ocean, and fish whenever she wanted. She would be so happy one day. Lacey and Jessica entered middle school together as close as ever, but there had been a considerable shift in maturity for Lacey. Despite her adoring affection for her American Girl doll collection, Lacey sat Jessica down and told her it was time to grow up. They had to stop playing with dolls, and Jessica admittedly was taken aback. Lacey seemed to always love playing with her dolls, and she practically obsessed over them. She acquiesced, and soon they sat in the room listening to music and fawning over the latest boy band. Lacey really excelled in school. The attention she received from educators and students alike made her feel wanted and special. She always sat at the front of the class and was extremely engaged in class discussions. Teachers would fondly recall Lacey's pleasant demeanor and enthusiasm to turn in her homework early. She adored the accolades given to her, even if the feeling was fleeting. Much of Lacey's middle school years were spent at Jessica Kyle's home. In 1998, Lacey arrived to the Kyle home disheveled and out of breath. She asked to speak with Jessica's mother, Lisa. Lisa met Lacey outside and closed the door. She was aghast at what Lacey revealed. She had confessed that she was the victim of molestation by a family member. Lisa immediately ushered Lacey inside and told her that she would take care of it. Immediately, Lacey perked up and hugged Lisa tightly. She found it strange how quickly Lacey's mood turned around, but she chalked it up to a child's mind protecting them from further trauma. Lisa called the Alabama Department of Human Resources, which in 1998 was the equivalent of the Department of Family and Children's Services. Lacey was permitted to remain at the Kyle household until an investigation was complete. She took to the Kyle family instantaneously. A week into her stay, Lacey began calling Lisa Kyle mom. This made Lisa uncomfortable, but again, she conceded that Lacey was dealing with a very traumatic issue and just trying to cope. The investigation concluded that there were no substantial reports of sexual abuse going on in the Spears' home. Lacey would return to her home several weeks later, but refused to embed herself into family life. She preferred sleepovers at the Kyle residence. Perhaps to avoid any future claims by Lacey, her parents permitted her to go. But I think back to my childhood and wonder, would my mom or grandma allow me to stay for weeks on end at my best friend's house? The answer would most certainly be no. However, Brittany and I were childhood best friends growing up and we did share an extremely close bond. I loved spending time with her, and you could say that we were pretty inseparable, much like Lacey and Jessica. However, despite our families being super welcoming of the other, I doubt they would be okay with being responsible for a child for a few weeks. It's unfathomable to me that Lacey's parents would permit this to go on, but I have to remember that they were likely dealing with their own health issues and two other children to raise. I will clarify that I am in no way implying that having a chronic illness impedes your ability to be a present and active parent. In my honest opinion, Lacey's parents failed her by not seeking assistance for her troubling behavior. To her parents, Lacey's antics, though troublesome, seemed to not be worth correcting or seeking help for. Lacey joined a local Baptist church she heard about from her neighbors when she was 14 years old. Those neighbors would often shelter Lacey, and instead of reporting her continued claims of abuse, would bring her to the Parkview Baptist Church for spiritual healing and distraction. Again, her parents failed to intervene or correct their daughter's obvious need for attention. Lacey thrived at Parkview Baptist. She joined the student ministry and enrolled in the church's softball league. Her parents were unable to take her to practice, but permitted her to ride with Linda Sandlin, a fellow congregant. Linda happily toted the children to and from practice, but began feeling things were off with Lacey when she started affectionately calling her mom. Many of their car ride conversations left Linda feeling as if Lacey was a habitual liar and a fanciful storyteller. 
Linda learned quickly that Lacey's tall tales were reminiscent of movies she caught on the Lifetime Movie Network. Like most of the adults in Lacey's life, she didn't know what to make of her stories, but always tried to redirect her to something more grounded in reality. She noticed that when she did this, Lacey would just try to exaggerate the story that she had just told to seem more compelling. Linda refused to acknowledge the validity of the stories and again redirected Lacey's attention. When Lacey realized she was not getting the reaction she wanted out of Linda, she moved on to her teammates and friends at the church. One day, Lacey limped into church wearing an ankle brace. She impishly smiled at her friends who looked concerned. They all clamored around their affectionately named Lacey Bug to find out what had happened. Lacey tearfully confessed that she had taken a fall on the sidewalk and hurt her ankle. She promised she would be okay, but appreciated all of the concern brought to her. The following day, when asked by another person what happened, Lacey dissolved into tears. She said she suffered from anorexia and collapsed due to a lack of nutrients. The lack of food affected her bones, which caused her to hurt her ankle. A nearby friend overheard Lacey's tearful confession and retorted, Lacey, you had a giant hot dog yesterday. You're not starving. Lacey's tears immediately dried and she coolly looked back at her friend and said, That was the only food I had all week, and began sobbing into her other friend's embrace. Lacey had mastered the art of manipulation. Her classmates in middle school were all privy to Lacey's troubles. She made no effort to hide them. She confided in anyone who would lend an ear that she was in counseling for her eating disorder and sexual abuse trauma. They all consoled her, but some friends began to see the lies protruding through Lacey's stories. She completed her middle school years with a rather robust tale. She shared with Linda Sandlin that she was pregnant and didn't know what to do. She went back and forth on if she would terminate the pregnancy or keep the child. Linda urged her to speak with her parents, but Lacey declined, stating that she could take care of her child without them. In the weeks that followed, Lacey revealed to Linda and friends that she had sought out an abortion. The hospital she named caused red flags to immediately go up. That hospital did not perform abortions. When confronted with this information, Lacey then said she had actually traveled to Clearwater, Florida to have the abortion performed. She knew there was no way her friends could refute that claim, and once again, Lacey ignored the questions and instead focused on the grief the decision caused her. She told friends that she was meant to be a mommy, just not right now. Decatur, Georgia didn't have many part-time jobs to offer students. The one place that always welcomed members of the Spears family was Jack's Burger Place. She excelled and eventually became the head cashier at the restaurant. Patrons recall her being attentive and talkative, but rarely seen socializing with boys her age, which some would expect of a teenage girl. Lacey continued to complain about her home life and said that all her family did was fight. To outsiders, the Spears family seemed to be putting on appearances whenever out in public. It was a stark contrast to Lacey's statements about the terrible home life she had. Lacey's love and affection for children would lead her to volunteer at the church's nursery. She adored the children she cared for and would dote on their every need. She treated the children much like her American Girl dolls. She once took a child named Daniel out of the nursery and walked around with him on church grounds. When his mother found out, she was furious and spoke to the nursery leader. The leader chastised Lacey and Lacey apologized for the infraction stating she would have never harmed the child. This was such an odd statement coming from the teenager that the mother refused to leave her child in the nursery when Lacey was present. Lacey graduated from Decatur High School in the spring of 2006. She wasted no time in moving out and finding an apartment to rent with her sister, Rebecca. Rebecca had graduated from college and welcomed her little sister into her new life. She had missed the time they spent together and encouraged her to find a more stable job. Lacey applied and received a job at the kids' club daycare. 
She devoted all of her time to the daycare, often arriving for the first morning classes and staying until pickup. Her bosses were impressed with her enthusiasm and eventually, Lacey earned the responsibility of key holder. She was tasked with opening and closing the center each day. Rebecca continued to encourage Lacey to start dating. She rarely heard her sister speak about any men in her life. Rebecca was unaware of Lacey's previous claims of being pregnant. She was ecstatic when she learned that her sister was seeing a young police officer named Blake Robinson. He met Lacey through mutual friends at church. Blake was a devout Baptist who honored his belief to save his virginity for his new wife. They went on three dates, but there, Blake didn't feel any sparks with Lacey. He thought their brief courtship ended amicably, but he would later tell police that Lacey screamed at him in public after they broke up. He never spoke to or saw Lacey again after that incident. Lacey mended her broken heart by enrolling into Calhoun Community College. She wanted to be a pediatric nurse so she could help those who needed it most. She quickly became a star pupil and her classmates enjoyed her company. She met Christy Burnham in class and offered to help the young mother out with her son Cameron. Christy enthusiastically agreed to let Lacey watch her son. Christy wasn't initially put off by Lacey's constant request to watch Cameron. She figured that Lacey just loved being around her son and caring for children. She enjoyed being able to go out with Cameron's father and her friends. She had Cameron when she was a teenager, so she had some catching up to do. She even allowed Cameron to stay overnight with Lacey since she already had a crib, diapers, and food in her home. It wasn't until Christy was out with Cameron one afternoon that she was approached by someone who knew Lacey. The woman enthusiastically greeted baby Cameron and asked Christy if she was looking after Lacey's son. Confused, Christy clarified that Cameron was her child. The woman was confused and said she could have sworn the baby was Lacey's son, Cameron. Christy again stated that Lacey watches her son, but that was not his mother. The woman apologized for the confusion and left the stunned Christy to contemplate the encounter. She began noticing that Cameron was suffering from chronic ear infections, but only on the days that he was in Lacey's care. When he was back at home, the ear issues resolved. One day in 2007, 19-year-old Lacey was watching Cameron for the weekend. When Christy returned to her mother's home, expecting to find Cameron in his crib, her mother stated that Lacey had not brought him back yet. Concerned, Christy called all of their friends to inquire about Lacey's whereabouts. When she finally got in contact with Lacey, she ordered her to bring her child back. Lacey reluctantly agreed but seemed angry to hand over Cameron. Her anger quickly subsided when Christy said she was no longer allowed to see Cameron. Lacey broke down and begged her not to take the baby away from her. This encounter solidified to Christy that something was wrong with Lacey. She yelled at her to get out of her house before she beat her ass. Lacey, still sobbing, left, but not before she told Cameron she loved him. Lacey quickly turned her adoring attention to another mother she befriended during her time at Jack's Burger. Autumn Hunt was a single mother who needed childcare for her son Jonathan. Lacey told Autumn that she got a family discount at her job and would be happy to take Jonathan there if she really needed it. Autumn readily agreed and thanked Lacey for looking out for her and her son. Lacey continued the same pattern of emotional manipulation and coerced Autumn into letting her watch Jonathan. Lacey had dismantled the crib that baby Cameron once slept in and she needed help putting a new one together for John John as she affectionately called him. She knocked on neighbor Chris Hill's door. He answered, and when he saw who was knocking, he was surprised to see Lacey Spears. He would tell Sean Cohen at the Westchester County Journal News that, quote, Lacey was very quiet. You'd really have to stop her and say, hey, 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 for her to talk to you. She was cold or just very antisocial. When she asked if he could put a crib together for her, he agreed and followed her upstairs to her apartment. They spent some time chatting about various things, and when Chris finished building the crib, Lacey said they should hang out more often. Chris and Lacey began having a friends-with-benefits type of relationship. 
they really didn't invest much time in getting to know each other before they decided to become sexual. In some foreshadowing, knowing how this story ends, I wonder if Chris was just another pawn in Lacey's own version of a Lifetime movie. I could speculate all day long about Lacey's motives and her intentions, but we will never truly know, despite the interviews Lacey has given, she never clarified her motives about anything. Lacey became active on social media during this time. MySpace and a brand new website called Facebook were ways for her to show off her new life. She was proud of her current career as a daycare teacher and as a part-time student. She shared pictures of herself with John John, and when asked, Whose kid is that? She replied, He's mine, and was born on Valentine's Day. Autumn was completely unaware of Lacey passing her son off as her own online. Lacey encouraged Autumn to go out of town to visit her boyfriend as often as possible. She told her not to worry, she would ensure John John was well taken care of. During this time away, Lacey managed to care for John John without much assistance from Autumn. She posted about John John every single day on her various social media accounts. One particularly disturbing photo shows Lacey and John John kissing on the lips while the caption reads, I love him so, my John John. Lacey continued her relationship with Chris and eventually discovered she was pregnant. She was thrilled to be welcoming a child and it was now her turn to truly be the loving and caring mom that she always wanted to be. When she told Chris that she was pregnant, he wasn't surprised. They hadn't been especially cautious while being together and he encouraged her to look up names for their new child. He asked her about marriage and if they could be together to try and give their child a family, something he never really had. At first, Lacey seemed open to the idea of being with Chris. She told him the name Garnett was what she envisioned for her child, but Chris said to keep looking for another name. He wasn't sold on it. Lacey's demeanor towards Chris changed right after that discussion, and she turned on him. When Chris approached the subject of marriage again, Lacey told him that the baby wasn't his and that she wasn't going to get married to him. He was so confused by this interaction. After threats from Lacey of obtaining a restraining order, he decided to stay away from her. He tried to approach her, but she was cold in her responses to him. She told her sister Rebecca that she was expecting, but remained mum on the other details, like who the father was. Rebecca had her suspicions that it was Chris, but Lacey never confirmed that information with her sister. Autumn became increasingly worried about her son's health when he began to suffer from chronic ear infections. John John's pediatrician was also concerned and suggested that Autumn consider inserting tubes into his ears. In late 2007, Lacey befriended a woman named Shauna, who had two young sons. The boys, McKelly and Zach, took to Lacey right away while they attended Kids Club. Shauna loved that her kids were well looked after and knew that Lacey often watched kids who attended Kids Club on the weekends. Lacey asked if she could watch the boys for Shauna and she agreed. She noticed that Lacey was expecting her own child and congratulated her. As Shauna and Lacey grew closer as friends, Lacey confided in her that she had been sexually abused as a child. Shauna consoled her and often stayed up late on the phone with Lacey while she cried about how helpless she was. She would even call and say that her unnamed family abuser had just left her home and attacked her. Shauna told her to come over to her house whenever she felt unsafe and Lacey eagerly accepted this invitation. Soon, Lacey was spending a lot of her free time at Shauna's home helping her with the children. She often brought John John along with her, and Shauna was under the impression that John John was Lacey's son, but when Autumn and Shauna bumped into each other picking up their children at Lacey's apartment, Shauna was understandably confused. When Autumn left, Shauna said that she thought Lacey was John John's mother. Lacey chuckled and said, no, he's like my son, but John John is my stepsister's son. This was a clear and deliberate lie. To deflect from that conversation, Lacey shared that the father of her unborn child was her abuser. Shauna was shocked and hugged her friend closely, trying to console the crying Lacey. Lacey began shopping around the story of losing her soulmate and Garnett's daddy, Blake. 
she found out that she was having a boy and began shopping for his nursery. As her baby bump grew, she posted photos of John John kissing her belly with a caption that implied John John was Garnett's big brother. It was strange that Autumn, who trusted her friend with her son, was not friends with her on MySpace. She had no idea that Lacey was posting pictures with her son and taking him to various churches requesting assistance. It wasn't that Lacey was purchasing the items that she needed. She was begging with John John. Unsuspecting churches helped the young woman they believed to be a mother in need. The relationship with Shauna fizzled out when Shauna's mother-in-law questioned Lacey about her past. She felt something was off with Lacey and told her son about their encounter. Shauna's husband was growing concerned about Lacey's continued request to watch their children or coming over uninvited just to help with the kids. Her presence was intrusive and she oftentimes acted as if she were the mother and Shauna was the babysitter. When Shauna informed Lacey that she needed her key back and wanted a break from their friendship, Lacey exploded on her. She screamed that she couldn't believe Shauna would do this to her after everything Lacey did for them. For free, she might add. Shauna's husband ordered Lacey out of their house, and that was it. Shauna and Lacey only kept in contact via social media. It was there that Shauna saw the post from Lacey's baby shower, which depicted her posting pictures with captions about missing her fiancé and father of her child. Shauna was suspicious that Lacey lied about being abused and that she likely became pregnant by Chris Hill, who she knew Lacey had a sexual history with. She kept quiet on the subject and just commented, congrats, on one of her posts. On December 3rd, 2009, Garnett Paul Spears was born. Lacey lived on social media, so being away from it for four hours to have a baby was inconvenient. As soon as she could, she took photos of Garnett and posted them on MySpace. She was 21 years old and bounced back rather quickly from giving birth. She still insisted on taking care of John John for Autumn. She posted pictures of the two first meeting each other and wearing matching outfits. The caption read, Big Bro and Little Bro. When Autumn found out that Lacey was misrepresenting her relationship with John John, she was very upset. This was the second time that Autumn had to speak with Lacey about her saying she was John John's mother. Lacey apologized, but this encounter seemed to turn her sights onto another child, her own. Days after Garnett's birth, Lacey brought him to the emergency room where she claimed that he had a fever, jaundice, and a possible ear infection. She told doctors and nurses that she was so sick with worry. The nurses and doctors who examined Garnett gave him a clean bill of health, but Lacey was frustrated that there was not more done for her child. She knew in her heart that something was wrong with her baby. A few weeks after the first emergency visit, she returned again, complaining that Garnett was sick. Lacey soon realized that doctors and nurses weren't going to give her the attention she craved. Their job was to assure a family that their loved one would be okay. They wouldn't be the prayer warriors that Lacey thrived for. She took to MySpace and posted a photo of Garnett in a hospital bed with an IV coming out of his arm. She lamented about how worried she was for her new bundle of joy, and her friends assured her that they would pray for her and Garnett. She thanked them and soon began using social media to get the attention she had been craving all of her life. Lacey had now elevated from a wannabe teen mom to a single mother dealing with a child who was constantly in and out of the hospital. Soon after the IV visit, Lacey brought Garnett to the hospital almost every day. Doctors noted on Garnett's file that Lacey was exhibiting red flags due to her behavior. They noted that Lacey often presented Garnett with a diagnosis as if she had studied the symptoms and names of the illnesses. When asked if she had a background in medicine, Lacey stated that she was a nurse and other times would say that she was a nursing student. Neither, of course, was true. Lacey had long dropped out of college and focused on running an in-home weekend daycare along with her full-time job at a new daycare, Children's Network. During one visit in January of 2009, Lacey made a statement to the attending physician that she often thought of hurting Garnett. 
Her statement was immediately recorded and reported to the Medical Social Services Department. When meeting with an investigator, Lacey was a far different mother than she presented online. She was extremely inattentive and did not seem very close to her son, allowing him to just sit in his car seat while she blankly answered questions. The investigator attempted to visit Lacey several times in the subsequent months by showing up to her apartment. She was never able to make contact with Lacey after her initial visit, and the investigation was eventually closed. This would be the first of many failures in the bid to save Garnett Spears. The investigation did not deter Lacey. She seemed to pass it off as if the event never happened. Lacey stopped bringing Garnett to the local hospital and instead traveled a further distance to have Garnett treated. Doctors listened to Lacey's concerns that her son was not eating and projectile vomiting. He was becoming dehydrated and she had no idea what was wrong with him. All she wanted was for her son to get better. At six weeks old, Garnett had been to the emergency room at least 30 times. He was diagnosed with reflux and underwent a procedure to help address the issue. Lacey posted a photo of Garnett on MySpace recovering from his surgery. Several incidents were reported to Child Protective Services of Lacey yelling at a young Garnett. He was barely nine weeks old when Lacey was seen shouting into his face in a Walmart parking lot. An acquaintance witnessed the encounter and immediately reported it. The intrusion of Child Protective Services did not affect Lacey from seeking medical attention from her son. This time, nine-week-old Garnett was again diagnosed with reflex and failure to thrive. He was scheduled for another procedure that would essentially prevent him from vomiting up his formula. When Lacey returned a few weeks after the surgery, she complained that her son was not taking any of the formula she offered him. A doctor also attempted to feed Garnett with the formula provided to him by Lacey and observed the same behavior. Garnett was transferred to a different hospital to have a feeding tube inserted in through his nose. Again, Lacey shared this new revelation on MySpace. She returned again with the same complaint a few days after the nasal tube was removed. Garnett was again refusing formula from his mother. When a nurse attempted with the same formula, she was successful in getting Garnett to take the formula. Almost instantly after finishing the bottle, Garnett was lethargic. The doctor approached Lacey and asked about the formula, and all Lacey offered as an excuse was that the formula was improper. The doctor ordered a blood panel on Garnett and found that his sodium levels were extremely high. The high sodium level caused Garnett's brain to swell and he had a seizure. Any level over 150 is considered dangerous. At the time of the blood draw, Garnett's level was 180. He was airlifted to a pediatric ICU unit for further monitoring. Lacey kept her loyal followers on MySpace abreast of Garnett's ever-changing condition, posting photos of him lying unconscious and intubated in ICU with a caption that read, He was very sick and I didn't know, and I don't feel good, Mommy. Further tests revealed that there was no clear explanation as to what caused the sudden rise in Garnett's sodium levels. I want to remind you, the listener, that Garnett is just barely two months old at this time. The medical staff cleared Garnett of any medical issue, but could not figure out why his mother was having such a hard time feeding him. They quarantined Garnett from Lacey for several days. His condition dramatically improved, and he ate normally. When asked how she was feeding Garnett, Lacey claimed her pediatrician recommended that she dilute her breast milk with Pedialyte. Pedialyte is used to help replenish electrolytes in children. Despite their suspicions, Garnett was released into the care of his mother. I've lost count by now how Garnett's life was failed again and again. And I have a suspicion that you will too as the episode goes on. During the continued research of this case, I was insanely appalled by the harm brought to Garnett. He was observed by multiple doctors with fresh pools of blood in his ear, despite the infections being months apart. Doctors noted that the blood should have healed, but it was still fresh. Knowing what we know about this case, 
we can surmise that some type of object was inserted into Garnett's ears to cause the injuries. By September of 2009, Garnett had been admitted into the hospital 23 times. Lacey continued to beg for a feeding tube, but doctors refused. She kept trying until she was finally given what she wanted. She documented Garnett's journey pre- and post-op for all of her social media followers. She waited by her computer until notifications popped up in the comments section. She seemed to be unconcerned with her son's recovery and more interested in maintaining a web presence. She posted photos of Garnett's feeding tube port that poked out of his stomach. Around this time, she signed up for Twitter and began tweeting from the account at Garnett's Mommy. She moved over to a newly created Facebook account and stopped updating her MySpace. The open network allowed her to reach a wider audience who would fawn over her. Some followers began to grow suspicious with the numerous sad updates coming from Lacey. Lacey responded in a Facebook comment that said, Someday, all the lies, gossip, and judgments I watch you create will come back around and smack you in the worst way possible. Lacey, with the assistance of her sister, would take Garnett around to different churches to ask for assistance in his care. Food, clothing, diapers, money, anything they could offer would help. Lacey was not only brazen enough to forge a death certificate for a child she never had, but she was also open with how she mistreated her living son. She made another post to Facebook that said she felt so guilty for getting angry at Garnett and giving him a freezing cold bath. A nurse that befriended her named Ginger had witnessed the troubling incident. She claimed she saw Lacey yell at Garnett for an infraction and hold him underwater. Ginger immediately stepped in and took Garnett from her and confronted her, but failed to report this to CPS. The post from Facebook did prompt someone to reach out and report Lacey for the abuse. Again, nothing happened. In 2002, Lacey picked up and moved to Clearwater, Florida. She claims it was for a new start, but it was likely to begin a new medical journey for Garnett. She stayed at her Uncle Bo's house and introduced Garnett to neighbors who were confused as to why the boy had a feeding tube when he seemed to eat by mouth without any issue. Kimberly Phillipson, the next-door neighbor to Uncle Bo, grew quite close to Lacey. Lacey confided in her that she was a victim of child sexual abuse and incest. She shared that several relatives molested her, but one family member had raped her and abused her well into adulthood. In fact, that male would often call Lacey and have phone sex with her. One particular occasion had Lacey crying in Kimberly's arms. She said she was impregnated by the family member who had terrorized her since childhood. At this point, Lacey didn't anticipate Kimberly's response. Kimberly offered to arrange an abortion for her. Lacey hesitantly agreed, but when Kimberly arrived to take her to the appointment, Lacey claimed to have had a miscarriage the other day. Kimberly was assisting Lacey's Uncle Bo with his hospice care when she observed the relationship between Tina and Lacey Spears. Tina ordered Lacey around and even pinched her hard in the back of the arm when she didn't like how Lacey spoke. Lacey shot her mother a dirty look, but never confronted her. Kimberly did not appreciate the way Tina treated Lacey and spoke out of turn. Tina and Kimberly verbally fought, and as Kimberly left, she told her about Lacey's claims of being continuously molested and that she had just recently suffered a miscarriage. Lacey's grandmother stepped in and told Kimberly that Lacey had issues with telling the truth. The response shocked her. It was then that she realized the Spears family enabled Lacey's troublesome behavior. During her time in Clearwater, Florida, Lacey began experimenting with holistic care and a vegan diet. She insisted that the change in diet and alternative to Western medicinal practices would help Garnett with all of the illnesses that ravaged his small body. Inserting herself into these Facebook communities and local groups allowed Lacey another outlet to call attention to herself and Garnett. In 2011, a CPS investigation into Lacey's treatment was launched. The investigation was closed when it was determined that the complaint came from a person who had no direct contact with Lacey. 
That same year, Lacey created a controlled Facebook page called Garnett's Journey, which documented all of his medical issues. She restricted her family from being able to see the fan page because she was sharing information about Garnett's late father, Blake. On June 3, 2011, Lacey created a post called, Mommy, Where's My Daddy? An excerpt from the post reads, A little hand pulled on my shorts and said, Mommy, where is my daddy? Now I had spent some time pondering how I would answer this question. And this wasn't the first time he had asked, but I knew until I felt safe answering him, he would just continue to ask. Do I give details? Do I tell him the truth or do I butter it up for him? As a parent, we want to protect our child from anything that could harm or hurt them, so answering this simple question was a challenge. But I had finally found a way to explain to Garnett just where his daddy was. I placed the dish I was washing in the sink, dried my hands, bent down to his level so he would know I was fully connected to him. I looked at my son in the face and said, Your daddy is in you. He is in your eyes, ears, nose, arms, legs, heart and soul. Your daddy is half of you and mommy is the other half. I thought to myself, Okay, I answered him. Garnett just peered at me for a moment and, with a sweet, blissful voice, replied, Awesome, and ran off. Awesome, I thought. How could someone at such a young age find that awesome? Nevertheless, he thought it was awesome, and for today, he is pleased and at peace with my answer. I know the day will come when Garnett asks me again where his daddy is, but for today, he thinks it's awesome that his daddy is in his ears, eyes, mouth, nose, arm. No matter where Garnett's father is, he will always be in him, and he will always be a part of him. Writings of this nature flooded her page. Lacey continuously received praise from those who followed the page. She promoted an image that she was a supermom. Not only was she staying fit by running for miles in the mornings while Garnett was asleep, but she was also tirelessly advocating for her sickly child. She vented on Facebook how Garnett's symptoms were being ignored and how negative people attempted to bring her down. In another post, Lacey mentioned to her newly amassed followers the tragic history of her true love, Blake. She detailed how he died in 2010 and it had been the most torturous nine months of their lives. She spoke to the deceased Blake through her writings, telling him that she missed him and needed him badly. Many sympathetic followers were concerned for the young mother as her posts sometimes alluded to suicide. Lacey was growing tired of the continued attention she was getting from Florida CPS and looked for a new place to call home. She was told by a friend about Waldorf Education. According to their website, Waldorf Education, or Steiner Education as it is sometimes referred to, was founded in the 20th century based on the insights, teachings, and principles of education outlined by the world-renowned artist and scientist Rudolf Steiner. The principles of Waldorf education evolved from an understanding of human development that addressed the needs of the growing child. Lacey wanted Garnett enrolled because they believed in a holistic approach to education. She searched furiously for an adequate location and finally settled for Chestnut Ridge, New York. Lacey packed up her and Garnett's belongings and headed up north. In November 2012, Lacey accepted a job with the fellowship community. In exchange for working, Lacey would get free room and board for her and her son. This was truly a dream come true. On the application, Lacey wrote that her and Garnett had no medical needs and were overall very healthy. Despite planning the move to New York for several months, Lacey failed to inform her loyal followers of the changes. When members of the fellowship met Garnett for the first time, they instantly loved him. He was exuberant and extroverted. Lacey shared a common living space with a roommate named Christine at the fellowship. Christine observed that Lacey would often yell at Garnett and yank his arm very hard to get him to face her. If Garnett cried, Lacey would immediately snatch him up and soothe him. 
It astounded her the lengths Lacey went through to pretend that she was a great mother. Christine also noted that Garnett ate whatever was placed before him and had no trouble eating. Things for Christine weren't adding up. She was uncomfortable around Lacey and avoided conversations with her. They would ultimately turn into a woe is me type of conversation about her past love and Garnett's health struggles. She would ultimately leave the fellowship after making numerous complaints about the way Lacey treated Garnett. Lacey became close with a woman named Una Friedman. She often helped Lacey with Garnett and took her to town to spend some time away from work. She confided in Una that she was interested in getting pregnant again or adopting a child in need. In late 2013, Lacey began the constant barrage of hospital visits documenting each one with a photo on Facebook and Twitter. When Garnett started kindergarten that same year, his teachers noticed how energetic he was. Despite Lacey saying how much Garnett struggled to eat, they asked her to bring him more of his special diet food because he was still hungry afterwards. The year passed without much issue until winter break. When Lacey went home to Clearwater, Florida, she sent frantic emails to his teacher stating she wasn't sure if Garnett would be back for the first day of classes, since he was currently in the pediatric intensive care unit. She asked them to pray for her son, and that she would keep them abreast on the ever-changing situation. He returned to school in January 2014, a newly minted five-year-old. He gave no indication that he had suffered during his winter break. His teachers were relieved to see the old Garnett back, Lacey had struggled to get pregnant during this time, often sleeping with random men in the hopes that it would happen naturally. She must have known that she couldn't control Garnett forever. Everyone at the fellowship loved and adored him. He earned the nickname Mayor because of how often he checked in on people and greeted them warmly. He was becoming a problem. Lacey would have to leave again if she couldn't maintain control. Or, she thought to herself, she could just contain the problem. She kept Garnett from going back to school, claiming her son was suffering from a relapse and running a fever of 104 degrees. She did seek homeopathic medical attention, but when observed by those doctors, they found Garnett to be in good health. There was no obvious medical reason that Garnett was in a state of distress. Lacey, not satisfied with the response, up the ante. She brought Garnett to Good Samaritan Hospital a few days after January 8, 2014. She claimed that Garnett was having seizures, vomiting, and explosive diarrhea. When taken back into a room, there were no obvious signs that Garnett was having any issues. Further tests revealed that Garnett's sodium level was elevated to 147. He was discharged that same day and Lacey returned home with her son, updating the fellowship via Facebook. On January 17, 2014, Garnett's teacher stopped by Lacey's apartment to check on him. She entered the home and saw Lacey holding an obviously distressed Garnett. She noticed an IV bag full of a cloudy, milky, white solution that was being prepped for Garnett's G-tube. She was shocked to hear Lacey's cool and calm tone as she worried about his current state. She said she would call a friend to bring her a car so she could take him to the ER. Once his teacher left the apartment, Una Friedman received a frantic call from Lacey Spears. She shouted that she needed to get to the emergency room because he was having another episode and not being responsive to her. Una came by and loaned Lacey her car. Garnett was barely verbal but was able to ask if a friend would be coming over to be with him. Una assured him that he would be better and patted his leg. She was dropped off at her home, and Lacey turned the car back around to head to the ER. On the way there, it is reported that she pulled over and snapped a picture of Garnett in his car seat. She uploaded the picture to Facebook, asking that everyone pray for G, as she called him. When she arrived to Nyack Hospital, she informed the staff that her son had five seizures that day and was getting worse by the minute. Garnett was admitted into the hospital for further tests. Lacey ran through the list of diseases that he suffered from and mentioned the surgeries he had to help address some of those issues. When asked about his dry heaving, 
Lacey noted that he had a Nissen fundoplication as an infant. It was clear that Garnett's body was trying to rid himself of something, but they needed time to figure it out. Dr. Kevin McSherry, the primary physician assigned to Garnett, brought in two other physicians to help with his diagnosis. He did not have the typical signs of a seizure, so he expedited consultation with other physicians in the hopes of finding out the problem. Dr. McSherry was advised to give him an EEG, which would monitor the brain activity. One doctor became suspicious of the claims made by Lacey and suggested that she was the one with the illness. Perhaps she was suffering from Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Lacey spent much of the time Garnett was admitted on her phone, updating followers. When nursing staff advised her that his sodium levels were normal and that he had shown no signs of concern, she was unenthused. She left the hospital briefly while a friend stayed with Garnett to get some items from home. It is believed that she went home to retrieve an IV bag filled with the same concoction as mentioned before. Unfortunately for Garnett, Lacey returned to his room. As she lay next to her son, she googled on her phone, children's EEG, salt poisoning, sodium levels in children. Lacey was made aware by the EEG technician that the machine had audio and visual capabilities and would be connected to Garnett. The process was fairly cumbersome for the technician as Garnett seemed to be in good spirits. He eventually settled down and the technician completed attaching him to the EEG. The weekend progressed and every test ran on Garnett came back as normal. When his new attending physician, Dr. Sarika Sunku, observed him on January 19th, 2014, she informed Lacey that if the additional tests that she ordered came back as normal, then the seemingly healthy and rambunctious five-year-old could go home. Lacey again was unaffected by the news. Lacey was observed on the EEG video walking with Garnett to the bathroom adjacent to his hospital bed. The bathroom itself is not in view of the camera. Garnett bounced around and grabbed a cookie before he entered the bathroom with his mother. Lacey then walked out of the bathroom and grabbed her purse. She then walked back into the bathroom where, it was later learned, she connected Garnett's IV to a sodium-laced bag. Garnett walked out and got back on the bed. He attempted to purge whatever his mother gave him, but he physically could not vomit. He then expelled the contents with a bowel movement. A glucose test revealed that his sodium levels reached 204, which is a nearly deadly amount. Dr. Sunku orders more blood work and stabilizes him. In a few hours, it's almost night and day. He has recovered to an almost healthy five-year-old. The stability only lasted a few hours. Lacey had again taken her son to the bathroom. Garnett got on the bed and exhibited the same symptoms as before. This time, he became lethargic and exhibited signs of a seizure. Lacey quickly rushed to the bathroom, and in a quick glimpse, you can see a feeding tube protruding from her pocket. She sat down on the couch next to Garnett's bed where she is observed pulling out her phone and pointing it in his direction. She posted on Facebook that he is having another episode and went from bad to worse in a matter of minutes. At around 5.30 p.m., Lacey screamed for the nurse. The nurse observed the seizure Garnett was having and attempts to make him stop. Nothing seemed to work and the doctor attempted to sedate him so that he could be intubated. Garnett was no longer strong enough to breathe on his own. Una arrived just as staff were working on Garnett. She attempted to console Lacey, but Lacey got up and left the room to call her grandmother. Multiple staff members would say that Lacey was simply callous when news came that her son would be airlifted to Maria Ferrari Children's Hospital ICU. She refused to get into the helicopter with her son because she was scared, but finally did so when Una urged her that it was the right thing to do. Lacey continuously asked staff if her son was going to die, but her facial expressions didn't match her attempt at concern. She was questioned by the doctors about the last time he was fed through a tube. She attempted to lie and say that it had been weeks. Una, who had observed Lacey feeding Garnett days before, corrected her. Lacey turned around and glared at her for speaking up. She had to admit that Una was correct and that she had just forgotten. It was clear that Lacey was lying to the people 
attempting to help her son. The staff at Ferry worked tirelessly to wake Garnett from his last seizure. As Garnett recovered, still on life support, Lacey updated her followers. She answered question from concerned followers, but was not specific. She basically responded that everything was touch and go. In 48 hours of continuous and controlled monitoring, Garnett eventually woke up. He was alert, and his sodium levels were lowering by the hour. The doctor issued an order that prohibited Garnett from getting anything by mouth. If he were to drink any fluid, it would impact his sodium levels, swell his brain, and eventually kill him. Garnett continued to improve, and the good but cautious news was shared with Lacey. Her Facebook posts, however, were more bleak. She wrote that he was only growing sicker by the moment, and that he was screaming out in pain. Friends who visited him found her posts odd, as he had seemed to be subdued, but they commented and wished them well with prayers. Lacey thanked them and said she would keep everyone updated on G's condition. At 7.15 a.m., a code blue came from Garnett's room. The doctor rushed in and saw Lacey crying uncontrollably, leaning over her son. He was always suspicious of her and her behavior, but this code blue came out of nowhere. How is this possible? He observed a water bottle under Garnett's bed and ordered Lacey out of the room. He ordered a nurse to preserve that bottle. When he examined Garnett, it was clear his brain was swelling. His pupils were not responding. Garnett was stabilized, but a CAT scan revealed that his brain was lying flat against his skull, which is consistent with severe swelling of the brain. He was declared brain dead, and Lacey was informed of his diagnosis. She posted on Facebook that Garnett was brain dead, but she was not ready to let her son go. She put on quite a show after hearing the news. Her mother and father arrived shortly after the diagnosis and urged her to pick herself up off the floor and to be with her son. The attending physician informed her that he had referred Garnett's case to CPS because he believed his brain death was intentional and that the rise of sodium levels were not metabolically possible. Lacey nodded in affirmation and left the room. When detectives approached Lacey to question her about the suspected abuse, she was surprisingly talkative. She eagerly shared Garnett's troubled medical history, much like she shared with anyone willing to hear the story. She looked like she was crying, but detectives noted that there were no tears coming from her eyes. Another detective noted how clinical she spoke. She didn't play the part of a grieving mother well. Lacey's apartment was searched and several feeding bags, syringes, and two large containers of salt were collected and photographed. Lacey contacted a fellowship member and asked her to remove a feeding bag that was in her living room. The friend agreed, but kept the bag in her closet. She felt uneasy about the request and eventually handed the bag over to authorities. Lacey was questioned again by authorities and this time she put on quite a show. She sobbed and buried her head in her hands. When she was asked a question, she immediately calmed and answered their question stoically. It was becoming increasingly clear that Lacey's odd behavior and Garnett's current status were no coincidence. Throughout it all, Lacey continuously posted on Facebook and finally gave notice that she would be removing Garnett from life support. On January 23rd, 2014, Garnett Spears was removed from life support. Lacey updated her status to read, Garnett the Great journeyed onward today at 10.20 a.m. In Lacey's mind, her real status had now been elevated. She was now a mother who lost a child. In another stunning interview, Lacey declared, If I mixed up something that hurt Garnett, I didn't mean to. I didn't murder him. Baffled, Detectives tucked their statement into their memory. The day after making that statement, Lacey Spears sought counsel and attorney David Sachs. He advised that all communication would need to come through him. He also informed Lacey to stop speaking with the police. After the death of Garnett, Lacey left New York for Kentucky to live on the Spears family farm. The fellowship asked her to leave due to misrepresenting responses on her initial application. Lacey felt betrayed from all corners and Google searched ways to commit suicide. 
She arranged a small memorial where she accepted donations for the mounting medical bills she faced. It would take five months of investigation before Lacey Spears was arrested for the death of Garnett Paul Spears. She made no statements to detectives and turned herself over to be booked on June 15, 2014. She was arraigned that same day and charged with second-degree murder. She was held in custody pending trial. On February 5, 2015, Lacey's trial began. Prosecutors felt their case was strong enough to proceed without ever needing to mention Munchausen by proxy. They argued that there was no medical explanation for Garnett's sudden spike in sodium levels. The only explanation was that Lacey deliberately injected her son with high doses of salt in order to make him sick so she could elicit attention and widen her social media following. The defense team led by David Sachs countered that Lacey was a devoted mother dealing with a chronically ill child. She attempted various treatment methods without success, ultimately resulting in the death of her son. If she had competent medical professionals assisting her, then Garnett Spears would still be alive. The case was turned over to the jury to render a verdict in early March. On March 3, 2015, the jury rendered a guilty verdict. The prosecution requested that the maximum sentence of 20 years to life be imposed. The defense requested the minimum of 15 years be applied. On April 7, 2015, Acting State Supreme Court Justice Robert Neary delivered his sentence. One does not have to be a psychologist to realize you suffer from a mental illness, known as Munchausen by proxy. I hope you over the next few years come to terms with your condition. By not imposing a maximum sentence, I'm combining punishment with something that you really did not exhibit towards your son, namely mercy. Lacey was sent to Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women. She is eligible for parole on June 12, 2034. She will be 47 years old. She has given numerous television interviews since her conviction. In them, she continues to deny her role in Garnett's death and still alludes to not receiving adequate care for her son. She states that she's going to regain her freedom once her appeals are submitted through the court system. I personally hope that day never comes. What do you think, listeners? Do you think Lacey suffered from Munchausen syndrome by proxy? Or was she really failed by doctors? Share your thoughts with me in the Facebook discussion group. Just search for True Crime Fan Club Podcast. Okay, fan club members, as I conclude this episode, my one question to you is, how will you sleep tonight? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast player of choice. You can find us on most social media platforms, Twitter at TCFCPod, Facebook.com forward slash TCFC podcast, Instagram TCFC underscore podcast, and of course, our website is TrueCrimeFanClub.com. Music for the show was composed by Nico at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or WeTalkOfDreams.com. Audio engineering is provided by Chess Gray, who manages Chess Gray Music. Content warning at the top of the episode is provided by Tyler Allen, host of the Minds of Madness podcast. Content editing and research assistance for the show is provided by Brittany Martinez. <laughs>